So unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and, and charity, and service, and faith, thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. I'm going to uh, focus on verse 19 here, because we've, all, we've talked a lot about uh, some of the negative aspects of this church dispensation of Thyatira. We especially got into those, those apparitions and, and um, a lot of the, the uh, apostasy that uh, happens during this time. But there are some good things. that The, the church uh, dispensation and the words of Christ to this particular church dispensation is not all negative. And in verse 19, there's some real positive things. And I, I really like the way um, he, he, he starts with, I know your works. A big part of this, this, this church dispensation is Roman Catholicism. I mean, let's face it. It sticks out, you know, like a big old sword that, that comes up on the body of Christ. And there's a lot of negative things. You know, just like when, when a sword comes up and it's got pus underneath it, and if you was a lancet, you'd see all this yuck come out, right? This gross stuff. And that uh, that stuff inside is actually uh, not, not good for the body, right? So you got to let it out. And we've kind of pierced it. We saw all this um, stuff come out of that uh, that sore, if you will. But in verse 19, he does say something positive here. He says, I know your works. And there, down through history, there have been a lot of good works, a lot of good ministry to the poor, a lot of good things that were done. The things were done by peop, good people who loved humanity and uh, loved their, their fellow person and, and had outreaches. And so when we, when we speak of these things, I don't want to, I don't want us to get, um, uh, misconstrue it as, as we're, we're negatively, uh, talking about the, the individuals inside or what's represented inside this organization. When we say Ro- Roman Catholicism, there's, I, I still believe there's a lot of good people. The problem that I see is that the, the this woman Jezebel that, that uh, we see in the next verse, and we're not even going to look at her much tonight, I don't think, but um, with all this false teaching and all this this corruption that came in, it's not the, the individual people's fault. The members, they don't know any better because they're not taught properly. But they still, Jesus said, I know thy works. And, and I'm so thankful when I read that he knows what's going on. He knows us individually. He knows what our place is. He knows what we're up against. And he says, I know thy works. And he starts saying, I know thy works. And then he turns around after he says he's wrestling. He comes back to the works. Watch this. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. He says works twice. He begins with works and he ends with works and between all those works is works, right? He says, I know that works. Charity and service and faith and patience and thy works and the last, the last of these works to be more than the first. And so, I mean, this is a really great accommodation here to this people. But it's about the only good stuff he says right here. Okay, and then the rest of it is, but I have this against you. You have this spirit inside there, this Jezebel who, who teaches apostasy and fornication and idolatry and, and he, he demands a repentance. And so, so he's not, he's not against the, the people, all he's doing is telling them, you need to, you need to hear the word and repent. The problem that we're up against, and when I say we, as the church, corporately, the, the world church, if you will, and even in our own denomination, people seem like they don't 
They don't have time to listen. They don't. It's like they don't think that they need to hear the word. They don't need to be taught. I learned a long time ago when the scripture told me to study, to show thyself approved, a worker who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is a command. That command is just as much a command as thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not uh, commit adultery or thou shalt not uh, covet. And sh-, right? It's a command of God to study. We There's another scripture, and we hear it all the time. Uh, many times a preacher will preach. It's, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. How many have heard that? Heard that? And many times we've heard that, haven't you? From the pulpit. My, my people are destroyed for that lack of knowledge. Why do they have a lack of knowledge? They are willingly ignorant. In fact, clearly says they are willingly ignorant. Now, how can I say willingly ignorant? Because, and uh, John and I were texting back and forth about some other subject, but the, this idea of a willing, willing ignorant came up. And it, had, it didn't have to do with tonight's lesson or any, anything, but it's, it's when people don't care. They don't care about what's been written. Everything that Jesus said, everything that is hidden shall be made known. Both, I've, I've learned that both God and Satan, both of them, put everything out in front of us. You wonder how can, how can all this antichrist stuff, all this last day prophecy be fulfilled when it's being done right in front of our, our eyes? How do we elect the officials that we do? How do we allow the, the, um, what, how many, how many abortions have there been? Now, 60 million people killed, little babies killed by a boy. How do we allow that? And yet we do. How did they allow in Nazi Germany, how did they allow the Holocaust? But they did. We are willingly ignorant. Everything's out in the open. We could know and we, we, we would have the knowledge that we would not be destroyed. But frankly, in many ways we're lazy. You can carry that on to your physical health. I'm, I'm the uh, example. I know enough where I know the things that I do, and they're wrong, right? You, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't eat certain things. You shouldn't drink certain things. And we do, right? There's all kinds of health things we know. We should get the right exercise. We should get the right nutrition. We should... We should, we should, we should, we should, we should. We know all that about the body, and I'm saying the same thing is true of the spirit. We can know exactly what God wants us to do because he's revealed it to us. The only way we wouldn't know is because we're not seeking the truth. And that's what Satan uses to take advantage of us. I just had this thought. I'm assuming it comes from God. I'm going to use this illustration. You have your uh, your automobile, and when you buy the automobile, car manufacturer gives you a book. And in the book, it tells you the maintenance that you're supposed to do when you get the, you know, general. One of the things you're supposed to do is change the oil. And you could drive that. You could ignore that. You could just drive the car, drive the car, drive the car, never change the oil. And then eventually, the, you have the engine blow a rod or something. Whose fault is that? You didn't take care of it. They told you how to take care of it, but you didn't take... Why didn't you? Now you could say, well, I didn't know, but you did know. You just didn't care enough to look in the book and take care of it, right? And God has given us the manufacturer's book on how this thing works. And we ought to care about it. This is eternal life we're talking about. This isn't a vehicle that you can replace. This is eternal life. Praise God. And uh, we saw in the book of Daniel how a great empire would rise and then fall. And out of these ten horns of division, a religious beast would begin to emerge. Both are called Rome. 
The Rome, Rome the Empire and Rome the Catholic or universal religion of the Roman beast. So this beast we see up in the right-hand corner, if you'll remember, we see on the, how many horns we see there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight horns, right? There's one right in the middle of his head. There was ten to begin with, which we don't see when the one raised had risen, the eleventh horn, the one with the face on it, rose up. Three of them were uprooted. I don't know if you were here or if you remember we went over that. But uh, that comes from the book of Daniel. Anyway, the one right there on top of his head with uh, the eyes and the nose and the mouth, that is the Antichrist or the Antichrist system or the Antichrist kingdom. And the Antichrist is actually twofold, and we talked about that. We said there's a Catholic element, there's a, there's a, a Muslim element to this Antichrist kingdom that will be the, the end fulfillment. But the book of Daniel... Uh, gave us some keys here. But here's 10 key points that we picked out of that study. Um, number one, we found out it was going to be a worldwide power. Number two, it, it had to be a religious beast or there was some type of religious element to it. Number three, it arises among 10 horns. It must arise after 476 AD and it plucked up three horns by the roots. Um, it, uh, there was a, it would be a man speaking great things. Uh, you can see number eight there, he speaks blasphemy. We went over blasphemy. What, what is blasphemy? And um, uh, he would be, this kingdom would be diverse or different from anything that we've ever seen before, any other kingdom that we ever had seen before. It persecutes the saints for three and a half years. We all know there's a tribulation period. Tribulation period consists of seven years. In the, the Antichrist for the first three and a half years, the final manifestation of the Antichrist, who we call the Antichrist, he will emerge. And uh, for the first three and a half years, he won't really persecute the, the, uh, the Christian, or not the Christian, but the people of God at that time. But after the two witnesses are gone, there's nothing to stop him. And literally, all hell breaks loose upon those who are here. And it says he persecutes the saints for three and a half years. Well, we, we, we even talk about saints because we got in a couple weeks ago, we were talking about, uh, you know, people praying to St. Gabriel and St. Michael and St. Raphael and St. this and St. that. We said, those aren't the saints. We, the people of God, are the saints, according to the Bible, not these statues. And, uh, and really, when you pray to a statue, you're praying to some type of, spirit anyway, uh, behind that statue. And number 10, uh, this Antichrist would think to change laws and times. And so those were 10 keys that came out of our study when we went in and we looked at this uh, rising up, just to remind you. And we also talked about the, those, um, those 10 horns. Uh, they're listed on the next slide. Oh, wait, before we go, the underneath the uh, the map, you have the statue there, which is Nebuchadnezzar's image that he saw in the dream. Daniel uh, said that these king, these uh, the image represented all these kingdoms, and you can see there at the feet of this uh, image is a stone, and that stone represented Jesus striking the image, the Messiah coming, striking the image in his feet, and it would collapse. So it represents these kingdoms until the end time, beginning with the head, which was Babylon. But then you can see when, when the Roman Empire was there, in uh, after uh, after Jesus had um, had already visited the earth and he ascended into heaven, and then we see where the Roman Empire stopped persecuting the the Christians and became uh, the the um, uh, Constantine came in and the uh, Roman Empire was um, divided and there was two divisions from the east and on the east and the west, and you can see that the statue there has two legs. So all this is kind of like a reminder. So then when we go to to the next slide here, we also talked about those those ten horns. Three were uprooted. There were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. The, the um, Antichrist kingdom could not come into existence until those were uprooted. And the ones that remained, of course, you don't have to know what the names are on the left there, but they became the Germans, the Swiss, the French, the Italians, the English, the Portuguese, 
and the Spanish. They still exist even to this day. The rest of this stuff should be, that was a kind of a repeat. The, next, the rest of this stuff should be uh, relatively new, then I don't think we've covered any of this. But um, this person here, this is uh, St. Augustine, uh, or known as St. Augustine of Canterbury. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Anyway, when, it, when we talk about St. this or St. that, there's these ones, like we mentioned, there's this, the ones that they pray to that are supposed to be in heaven, and then there's ones who they refer to in their writings as, as saint this and saint that on this earth. We are, if we're in a church, we're all saints, so don't let that throw you. But there is, there is a historical person called St. Augustine Canterbury, and, and this Augustine of Canterbury was a, Be, a Benedictine monk who became the first Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 597 A.D. And now Pope Gregory the Great sent him to England to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. And when he got there, he reported that there were savage barbarians which existed throughout England. And Augustine was made the bishop then and given authority over all future English bishops. So isn't that something? So the, so the Pope sent him there, and then he gave him the authority over all future English bishops. You see how this outstretching of this authority, how Rome is, is trying to, to take authority even over England. Now we know from history what happened, right? The Anglican Church of England actually ended up the res, uh, coming out of that a uh, complete split from Rome, and, and we'll see that, uh, we'll see that later, but, um, Rome never did really have the authority that they pretended to have. There was, um, they claimed that um, when Jesus said to Peter, your name is Peter and on this, upon this rock I will build my church. It really is, if, if you understand Greek, it's a, it's a joke. It's, a, it's such a joke because they say the name Peter was Petra, which is a rock. But really the name Peter actually was, it was a small, uh, the literal meaning was a small pebble. The rock was Jesus. The rock was, we saw the rock with the image that was coming down to hit the statue, right, in the feet. That was the Messiah. And when Jesus was comparing himself and the gospel message that he brought with Peter, he said, but you are just a small pebble. He said, but upon this rock, he meant himself and the word of God upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so how they ever succeeded in making it, causing people to believe that from that Peter was given the keys of, of heaven all by himself. No, the 12 apostles were given the keys of the kingdom. Then they were sent into the world and they had the authority sent out by God. There was not 11 apostles plus one was in charge. There were 12 apostles. They were all equal. And out of those 12 apostles sprang forth the entire uh, Christian church and all the authority that goes back up to Jesus. And, and you know what? Jesus is in heaven. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, but he is on the throne. He is still alive, and he's still the boss. Who's, who's the one in the, in the music industry they call the boss? Bruce yeah, Bruce Springsteen. Well, Jesus is the real boss. Okay? There's no Bruce Springsteen is the, is the, Springsteen is the uh, boss. Jesus is the boss. The vicar of Christ is not the boss. The Pope is not the boss. Jesus is still alive. He's still on the throne. He dispatches us, right? He's still in control. So anyway, let's, let's look at well, what did this Augustine, what did he actually do? He was, he was dispatched to England. The Pope said he had authority over all the future English bishops. But let me enlighten you to what St. Augustine did. When he went out there, he massacred all, of the Celt or all these Celtic Christians. You say Celtic or Celtic, you can pronounce it either. I've heard it pronounced either way. So the, the Celts m permitted their uh, clergy to marry, and, and uh, they were Christians. 
Why would the Pope have Augustine massacre Christians because they weren't Catholic? It is exactly right. Because according to Rome, there is no Christianity outside Rome. That has never changed. Even though they'll tell you, well, you know, we're ecumenical now. We're trying to work things out and bring everybody. No, they're trying to bring everybody under the umbrella of Catholicism. But don't you think for a minute that anything has ever changed. When they get enough power, they will do the same thing that they've done in the past. And God gave us, he shows us the history and the evidence of what this beast that rose up, what this beast did, he will continue to do. He's just kind of at bay right now. Remember the, the scripture said there, there, the, the beast would suffer a wound and he would almost be like a mortal wound, almost put out a commission, and all of a sudden he comes back in vengeance. And that's what's going to happen. We're not, we're actually seeing the, we're actually seeing the rising back of the power of the papacy. Uh, and um, now we're going to consider what, uh, what they've done. But anyway, the reason the Celts were, were uh, massacred, here were the points. They permitted their clergy to marry. You're the first one to go, Pastor. Because you're married. And according to the Catholic Church, if you're, if you're a priest, you have to be celibate. Which is funny because the Bible says Peter had a wife. So they say he's the first pope, yet he had a wife. I think we'll, see, we'll skip the sexual part. But... Um, because we could talk about that the rest of the night. There's all kinds of stories, right? But, uh, but I, you know, I'm not here to, to, to speak about that. I, but I want to talk about factual stuff here. Um, another thing that, that here's what the, uh, these Celts were, uh, were guilty of. They, they refused to use the Roman Latin Vulgate translation of the scripture. So, according to the Vatican... According to the papacy, they were guilty and they should be put to death because they wouldn't use the Latin translation, which was approved by the, by the Pope. The third thing they did is they honored the seventh day as the Sabbath instead of Sunday. By all means, they should be killed for that. So they were massacred by this Augustine. And yet, if you talk, even throughout the Protestant world, if you mention St. Augustine, they think he was a good guy. Because we've forgotten. See, what's happened is throughout the churches, in the last 50 years, you don't hear. You don't hear anybody teaching about anything. The things we're teaching, and, and uh, it's hard to get copies of the, of the history of the things that, that happened. They're trying to uh, change the history. They refuse to accept the Sunday as, or Sunday as the new Sabbath day, which... Previous, uh, previously, we showed how one of the popes, I don't remember which one, but he, uh, he, he commanded that uh, everyone worship on Sunday. Sunday or Saturday, that's not the point. The point is you don't kill somebody and massacre a whole people because they, they, the day they worship. The fourth thing, they refuse to honor the pope or award him a place of authority. Well, I'm guilty of that. So... You know, I, I, one of these days, maybe they'll come and get me. I don't know. But they'll get him first because he's, uh, you know, he's the pastor. He, what did you say? I was being silly. I said, off with your head. Off with your head. So anyway, these Celts, the, the ones that survived, they fled to Ireland, uh, northeast of England, to run away from Catholicism, the Roman church. From there, they sent out, these are the Celts, they sent out many missionaries to northern Germany and established many churches. Even they suffered all this persecution, but they continued to doing the work of Christ. These same Celtic Christians would eventually be brutally massacred in Germany several years later by who? The Roman church through St. Boniface. And so they never, they didn't escape. They just ran 
They created churches as they went, and then Rome sent out another St. Boniface and massacred them in Germany. And the reason, again, because they allowed their pastors to marry. They, they wouldn't use the Latin Vulgate. They worshipped on the seventh day, and they refused to honor the Pope. Early in the 7th century, Roman Catholic authorities in Great Britain, with their secular allies, persecuted Bible-believing Celtic Christians, believing Celtic Christians in Britain and on the European continent. On one occasion, 1,200 British Celtic Christians were slaughtered by a pagan army at the instigation of Roman Catholic clergy. I think I have a slide here where uh, I have something uh, uh, underlined here and uh, from a historical book here. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that and pay uh, special attention to what's underlined. True to form at the meeting, Augustine remained contemptuously seated and no headway was made in shackling the British church to the rule of Rome. Thus rebuffed, watch this, Augustine issued the spiteful threat. If we may not preach the way of life to you, you shall at hands of your enemies undergo their vengeance. This evil later came to pass under Augustine's successor, in 613 A.D., inspiring Saxon allies to slaughter about 1,200 Celtic churchmen from the great Coley Abbey at Bangor on D as they defenselessly knelt praying in a field. <clears throat> and so it goes on and on. But this slaughtering, this slaughtering of the Celtic Christians, this is undeniable. And, and it wasn't just the Celts. It happened uh, to many others as well. Now, this next uh, person, uh, you won't recognize the picture because it's kind of fictitious, but uh, kind of looks uh, a little evil to me. This is uh, supposed to represent the prophet Muhammad. And uh, remember we talked about Catholicism, the papacy is, or pap uh, papacy is rising up about the same time Islam is ri rising up. Because he's born in 569, 570 A.D., around there. And you can see in his hands there, he's got the Koran. And he's bringing a new Bible, okay? His personal agenda was to tear down all the idolatry throughout the world, much of which was being ushered in by the organized church. Isn't that something? I mean, the Bible told us, thou shalt not worship images and icons. And when Muhammad came, he fueled the, uh, the passion of the Islam by saying, look at them worshiping idols, which obviously Moses forbid. In other words, there would not have been any fuel. There, would, there wouldn't have been anything, any passion behind the Muslims to attack idolatry if there was no idolatry in the church. They were sent forth to tear down idolatry, and he could point to the words of Moses and said, look, this is obviously can't be the truth. And so they kind of, we kind of set ourselves up, and I'd say we said, but I'm including us as the church in general, by not giving heed to the words and going and worshiping idols, we set ourselves up to be punished by Islam. I, and I kind of wonder if God didn't send the, uh, the Muslims in the first place just to wake us up and chastise us. And I speak uh, us again as an organized, as the organized church. I said, what are you doing? In fact, there was even the um, uh, emperors that they, they had a, a movement called the iconoclast where, where they, the emperors uh, in the Roman Empire arose and said, tear down these images. This is not of God. And they only lasted a small time until they could, until Rome could get their, you know, their image loving uh Pope's back in power, or emperor's back in power. This uh, next slide here, this represents a, uh, a change in doctrinal belief. Remember, um, we spoke about the millennial kingdom. We talked about the thousand years, thousand year millennial kingdom, right? Uh, this doctrine of post-millennialism came in about this time as well. What post-millennialism was is that uh, the belief that the that Jesus would come, and that the uh, but he would come in the the way um, uh, the Catholic Church um, modified it was that 
Jesus would come in the essence or, or the manifestation through the papacy. And the kingdom, millennial kingdom, would be or come forth out of the papacy, ushering in a thousand years of peace and prosperity. And so they basically, what did they do? They gave up on the original doctrine of the second coming of Christ, ushering in that millennial kingdom. In fact, uh, you don't, you can, you can go throughout uh, the churches throughout this country. There's very few churches that actually believe in a literal thousand-year kingdom that uh, Christ will set up here upon the earth. Now, we could argue, and, and, you know, some people say, well, you know, some people, you know, believe this, and some people believe that, and it doesn't really matter. Well, here's the problem. The New Testament talks about a thousand-year millennium. All of the, the Old Testament prophets do. God spent all of this, all these words. He, he spoke to the prophets all these words he had written down to tell us about the millennial kingdom. And now what, he changed his mind? Now it's not going to happen? Now this could be, seem funny, but remember, remember Jesus said this. He said, you will give an account of every idle word. God doesn't speak idle words. Everything in the book, every word of God has to come to pass. Every prophecy in the book has to come to pass. And so everything that talks about this millennial kingdom has to come to pass. That, that temple in the book of Ezekiel that takes up about 10 chapters has to be built. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. It has to be. Now here we have uh, Stephen II. It's about 752 A.D. He requested that Pepin, the king of the Franks, uh, would uh, lead his army to Italy and conquer the Lombards, which had attacked and pillaged Italy. Uh, what happened is, remember, we saw the horns rise up, the, the ten horns, three were uprooted, the, the papacy begins to rise. Um, Rome is being attacked by barbarous tribes from all over, and Stephen uh, convinces the uh, this Pepin, who's the king of the Franks at that time, to come and help him to uh, uh, attack these uh, Lombards, which were uh, attacking Italy. So Pepin was successful, and he gave a large portion of territory in central Italy to the Pope, which became the beginning of the Papal States. How many know that the, the Vatican is actually its own sovereign nation? It even has a chair and a place in the United Nations. It's recognized by all nations of the world. It's the only religious leader recognized by every nation, including the United Nations. It has its own sovereignty. It has its own military. It has its own intelligence. How many have ever heard of the mafia? Is the mafia controlled? But you know, some say, "Well, mafia doesn't exist anymore." Well, I, I don't, I don't buy that. I believe organized crime does not just go away; it just changes names. Anybody that thinks that there's no more crime or organized crime, it just changed. Their names change, a face change. Someone's got to be at the head of all this. This is when the the Pope got became, when, when the papacy became a sovereign nation. This is when they had, they got all this land, all these, all these papal states, and had their own sovereignty. This was the beginning of the kingdom, if you will. So they gave, the, the papacy had rightful dominion, and, it, and this continued for 1,100 years until King, King Victor Emmanuel returned territories to the nation of Italy in 1870. So in 1870, the, the uh, papacy actually lost all those papal states. And many people believe that this is when papacy received a mortal wound. This was very destructive to the authority because what happened is, how can you be a nation 
a sovereign king over territories that you don't own anymore. This is what happened to the, the Pope when they lost all of the states. It was a mortal wound on the head of the beast. And it looked like, from if you were, if you were an observer, you would think that would be the end of the papacy. You know when it revived? During the days of Mussolini, right around World War II. So here you have Pope Gregory III, and he was in 740 A.D. Uh, he, uh, he asked Charles Martel, who was the, um, I believe he's a son of uh, uh, Pepin. We were, just, we're talking about uh, uh, Pepin, who was the king of the France. Um, Charles Martel, he, he asked him to come to the Pope's aid against the Germanic tribes of the Lombards and the Muslims. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the Muslim kingdom, but we, this is why we were brought up Muhammad. After Muhammad's birth came this Muslims. They, they, they began out of the, uh, the Middle East, and they, they came down uh, through Africa, all the way through the North Africa, and came up into Spain, and they began to attack your, Europe, and something had to be done. And so the, the papacy needed help. And so they got uh, Charles Martel to come, and Charles Martel uh, pushed them back into Africa. You wonder how did uh, how did the Muslims ever get you know such a hold on it on the northern part of Africa? That's how they did it and when they did it. But note that uh, by 721, the Emir of Cordoba had built up a strong army from Morocco, Yemen, and Syria to conquer uh, Quetelin from the southwestern edge of France. The caliphate is called an empire. This, uh, the Muslim empire, you can see how it started there in the Middle East. Um, anything towards the right of the Mediterranean Sea there uh, was where it began. Well, actually, um, if you go down um, where uh, Mecca was, and uh, you can see the Muslims were in, in on the... Um, on the right side of that map, and all of the how the uh, the, the Muslims just uh, spread out across North Africa. You can see on the left, the top of the map at the left top corner is where Spain is. They came all the way through there and then up into the northern part. Now, if you you're we can't see too much the clarity of this map here, but when you see it on the video, you'll see that there's actually. Um, three different uh, colors schemes on this map that shows how the spread of Islam uh, actually uh, grew and uh, over the years. It didn't take that long. It, it happened pretty quick, actually. And you could see how large, if you, if you, if you could see, because the uh, Muslim Empire almost completely took over Spain. So uh, from the one, the one side of this map all the way to the other, that's how this, this is the Muslim caliphate, Islamic caliphate grew. The reason this is so important, just like we, our, uh, our Christianity has Bible prophecy about the end times, Islam has their own flavor of end time prophecy. Actually, the, um, the Messiah, which they call the Mahdi, the Messiah of Islam is actually the biblical Antichrist. So the parallels are, are incredible. But Islam teaches that the, uh, the Mahdi, the Savior, the Messiah, can't come until the caliphate, the Islamic caliphate, is reestablished, a new formation of a new empire. Now we're going to get into later, well, we'll see that Actually, at World War I, there was a uh, Islamic caliphate in power. You wonder how the mosque got in Israel or in Israel on the Temple Mount? It's because there was a Muslim caliphate. The Muslims took control over Jerusalem, and they had it for years and years and years. In fact, that's what the Crusades was about, right? Trying to get Jeru the Pope wanted to free Jerusalem. Um, from uh, from Muslim control. Now he didn't want to do it for the Jews. He wanted to do it for himself, uh, so that Rome could control it. 
Now, I don't know if you remember, but in Revelation chapter 13, there's, there's actually two beasts. One rises up with the seven heads and the ten horns. And then there's another beast that rises up afterwards, and he's got two horns. Remember, he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. Here in this one, you see the two horns on his head, and you see that's like a, a, a serpent tongue coming out. He spoke like, he spoke like a serpent. But um, this is interesting that the uh, that the, this uh, we call that beast the false prophet, and it has two horns. We know two horns represents two kings. Well, now let's bring up this next slide, and you can see here's the identity. The identity of these two horns on this second beast is actually Islam is one of the horns, and the other one is the papacy. And uh, we can read in the picture there is Pope Gregory III. It doesn't mean he is the Antichrist. The, the papacy represents one of the horns, and Islam represents the other. They're, two, they're both religions, though. And you can see what's going to happen eventually is the two will unite. And we read scriptures like who is like the beast and who can fight against him is what they say, what the um, people scream out in the book of Revelation. But in Revelation chapter 11, we read here on, the, on this slide, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. Picture of a, a on, the, on the right there, you see the Holy Koran. That's actually my uh, a copy of my, I scan a copy of my own Koran. I have copy of the Quran. But out of this Quran, there's a few verses. Uh, they're called surahs. We call, in our Bible, we call the, the verses biblical verses. They call them surahs. I don't know why, but um, I'm going to look at surah 65, surah 70, and surah 90 here on this slide. So I'll read it to you, but uh, because I'm not expecting that any of you have a copy of the Quran, nor would I suggest that you do have a copy of the Quran. Um, I have one just because I do, but uh, uh, actually it was a gift from some from somebody. Uh, of course, he turned against me when he realized that I didn't have any respect for it. But anyway, uh, people of the book, they call, the, uh, many times, this is a phrase that occurs in the Koran, people, people of the book, go not beyond the books, the bounds in your religion, the people of the book, and say not as to God, but the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only the messenger of God. So people of the book, don't go beyond the bounds of your religion. Don't say that Messiah, Son of Jesus, Son of Mary, is anything other than simply a messenger of God. Remember John, uh, John the Epistle said, who's the Antichrist? The one who denies that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Antichrist. He's, he's the spirit of Antichrist. Now we just said, the reason I have this slide up here, we just said that Islam corresponds to one of the horns on the false prophet. The false prophet represents the religious system of the Antichrist. And we see the spirit of Antichrist, right, coming out of the Koran here, where it says in Surah 65, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only the messenger of God, nothing else. In other places it says God has no son. In Surah 70 it says, they say God has taken him a son. You have no authority for this. So when we say God, that, that God has a son and his name is Jesus and he was born and Mary, the virgin, and he was crucified and he as, uh, ascended into heaven. They say, we have no authority to say that. What do you say concerning God that you know not? Those who forge against God falsehood shall not prosper. We shall let them taste the terrible chastisement for they were unbelievers. In other words, this is the justification for Islam to come after anyone who claims that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, one of the unique things about Islam, it has been pointed out by many people, is they behead people. And you can see it on the news, right? And you can see it, you can catch it on YouTube. Sometimes they put it on YouTube. They actually behead people. And they behead them for believing that Jesus is the Son of God. For not um, rejecting Christ and joining Allah and becoming Muslim. 
They believe they're justified because the Quran in chapter 70 says, we shall let them taste the terrible chastisement for they were unbelievers. Why? Because they're saying that God took him a son. In Surah 90, it says, And they say, The All-Merciful has taken unto himself a son. You have indeed advanced something hideous. Well, there's three verses right there, but there's a lot more in the Quran. In fact, anyone can sit down, they can read the Quran, and they would have to conclude this is spirit of Antichrist. There's no two ways about it. And... Uh, it's interesting how the two join later on. Uh, the two will join uh, it together to uh, to support this Antichrist king kingdom. So anyway, so what what we brought up here, we had a picture, a slide. We had Pope Gregory the Great, who was around 590 through 604. He represented the papacy at the same time. The Prophet Muhammad 560 was born 569 570. So right around that time 590, he's rising up uh, when he was in his 20s, and and uh, he represent the prophet of Islam. Together, they will eventually, you can see it actually on the horns, you can see um, in yellow there on the horns, one says Catholicism, the other says Islam. I put that on there so you can see it. Uh, how many recognize this character? He's got John's favorite hat. I thought John, John got bat, or, uh, he had become a member in the church, and I thought he was going to be given one of these hats. But, but here's, here's the stuff that's interesting about what's happening right now. This is right out of headlines. Pope Francis declares that Christians and Muslims are brothers and sisters. Wow, did you ever expect that, that the Pope would come out and make such an announcement? Interesting. Chrislam's Rick Warren, how many know who Rick Warren is? He's really famous in, in the church. He uh, came out with that uh, the book, uh, Princi what was it, uh, Principles? Purpose, purpose driven life. Yeah, and it was big. It was, it was, it, it was big, and um, he's very, uh, very popular in uh, in the uh, Christian community. Anyway, Chris, they, we say Chris Lam's Rick Warren because he is part. He's partnering with mosques to teach that God and Allah are the same. In other words, God and Allah are the same God. So uh, it's something to be aware of. If you ask an, if you ask a Muslim, if you say, uh, uh, "What does Allah mean?" And they would say God. But if you call God anything other than Allah, then they say it's unacceptable. You must call God by the name Allah. You can't. He said, uh, uh, Islam will say that Allah is the God of Abraham. But if you say, then Allah is equal to Jehovah, they would say yes. But if you call God Jehovah, they would say, no, you can't, you can't do that. you got to call him Allah because the name means God. Anyway, uh, uh, Rick Warren has, is uh, trying to, uh, to be helpful in uh, getting uh, mosques and uh, Muslims to, uh, to work together. Uh, with Christians. Pope Francis unites Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists to sign a pact with Rome. Let's all work together. And you can see this come, this is, this is like unheard of. This is things that, you know, I, I, I used to uh, warn and I used to uh, preach about these things that they were coming, they were coming, they were coming. And here, today, I mean, it, you can imagine you know, my skin's about ready to come off my bones when I see this. It's, it's, uh, it, to me, it's almost amazing to have, to have known that this is, it, it, this has to come and then to see it, to actually emerging. And yet, it seems like the rest of the world and, th and the rest of this country is almost silent. The rest of these denominations, who is speaking out against it? Very few people are speaking out against it. 
evangelicals and Catholics together. How many heard this? In March, on March 29, 1994, a joint declaration was signed called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. The compromise of the gospel lies at the heart of their agreement. But the gospel has not changed, or has it? According to what we're seeing with our eyes, according to what's developing, it seems like the gospel has changed. Major de Christian denominations have signed a pact with the Catholic, with, with Roman Catholicism, with the Pope, that they will no longer teach anything against the Catholic Church. They will never, they will not teach that there's any association of uh, Catholicism with Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist. Yet this is going on. And so you, you, you're seeing the beginnings of it. Uh, you can see uh, on, on this same slide, this famous, uh, it's kind of like a famous bumper sticker now, all over, coexists. Every one of those signs is a sign. Uh, in fact, I don't know what they all are. Let's see if we can go through it. We have uh, we have an Islam sign. Um, I'm not sure what the upside down uh, peace sign is. What is it? Ippies. Uh, well, it's upside down though, and it, it, it uh, it's like an. Now I know Satan takes the cross, and if you notice, the Catholic cross is bent. It's like bent. If you take it upside down, it's um, yeah, well, Satan yeah. always turned it down. My dad always called it the symbol of a broken cross. Kind of a broken cross, yeah. So, uh, and I don't know what this next one in the middle is. The other one is, of course, Judaism. Uh, the uh, the S there is the yin and the yang, right? And, of course, the cross, cross at the end for Christianity. And under, uh, anyway, the whole idea implied there is... We can form one religion because how many have heard this? Very common. All of us, all religions basically teach the same thing. It's not true. Well, yeah, today they basically teach the same thing because the church has stopped preaching the Bible. They don't all teach the same thing or they shouldn't all teach the same thing. In 800 AD, the Holy Roman Empire begins to rise. He's Charles the Great. You can see his picture here. Um, he was called, uh, his real name was Charlemagne, which the name means Charles the Great. You can see his, uh, his empire there. And you can see up there at the top, you can see Anglo-Saxon or, or the, the uh, British kingdom up there. Um, so you can get a proximity of, of where or how much of this, um, uh, where, where this empire was located. It's basically Europe here. You see where the uh, Muslims were there at the bottom uh, left corner and then underneath all of that is, uh, all the bottom part is like Muslims. And uh, then you have the rising up of Charlemagne to put a, uh, a stop against the advancement of Islam. In fact, if it wasn't for Charles the Great, uh, there we probably all would be Muslim today. Uh, so I guess we could be thankful that that he came and rose up at the time. He was the establishment of what they call the Holy Roman Empire. I don't know if you've uh, heard that the pro that Daniel's uh, prophecy uh, requires, and and the Book of Revelation requires that there be a revived Roman Empire. You probably have heard that uh, over the years gone by. Well, this is the fulfillment of the revived Roman Empire. Remember, we talked about um, the suffering of, uh, uh, we, we saw about the uh, Rome and the, the ten horns and the uprooting of the three horns, and the um, those seven horns continue to exist as separate entities. But here comes Charlemagne to begin to unite all of Europe under one, uh, under one em emperor, uh, empire and one emperor. Anyway, Charlemagne reigned for 46 years with many wars and conquests. Uh, by the way, uh, how many have heard Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich? 
Well, you ever wonder how did they jump to the Third Reich? Where, where was the First Reich and the Second Reich? <laughs> don't, don't you think you should, you should have a, a First Reich if you're going to have a Third one? Well, this is the First Reich right here. Holy Roman Empire. Charlemagne is, it's the beginning of the First, the first Reich. And uh, so Adolf Hitler becomes the Third. But uh, we'll, we'll actually get into that at some point in time. But uh, so Charlemagne reigned for 46 years, many wars and conquests. The kingdom spanned Germany, France, Switzerland, Austra Austria, Hungary, Belgium, Spain, <clears throat> Italy. He was one of the greatest influences in bringing the papacy to a position of world power and recognition. See, if it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be any papacy. And the Muslims would have conquered the papacy, and, and they and all of us would eventually have been Muslim. So I don't know how I really feel about that. Of course, I'm sure God would have intervened, but uh, there's no reason to speculate. I'm sure there was some good that came out of it, uh, because uh, there was protection being afforded. But remember, the protection is, as Charlemagne becomes emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor, he's beefing up the papacy. And uh, you still have all these Christians that are pushed underground because they don't recognize the papacy, right? They don't recognize the pope. So they're still being persecuted in the empire. So what's the difference if you're being persecuted by Islam or you're being persecuted by the Holy Roman Empire or or, or the papacy. You're still being persecuted. You're still being... We saw what they did to the Celts, right? We already talked about the massacre of the Celts who are basically are, uh, innocent. So after the death of, uh, of uh, Charlemagne, the kingdom would be divided as in the Treaty of Verdun, becoming the foundations of France, Germany, and Italy. There were, there were uh, I believe, three brothers. And uh, so it gave rise to the continual struggle between the popes and Germany and France kings. The Holy Roman Empire would continue for 1,000 years after this until Napoleon brought an end to it in 1806. <laughs> Napoleon, by the way, he actually went in there and <laughs> took the Pope hostage and threw him in jail and really crushed, uh, uh, crushed the uh, papacy's power at the time. So uh, they didn't like that at all, but, uh, but uh, that, it's kind of interesting. Like, next slide shows us the, now the division of Charlemagne's uh, uh, empire there. And, uh, yeah, it shows up pretty good here, So see the different colors. Here's something that uh, uh, I think is exceptionally uh, interesting. It's called the uh, Isidorian uh, Decretals. And uh, what this uh, represents is, I'll read it in a minute, but uh, there's a, there was a fabrication of these um, documents by the papacy, which were complete fraud, which they came up with these documents to prove that their authority stemmed all the way back from the Apostle Peter. Of course, it was all fraud. It was all fraud, and it was proven later. It came out, and they were exposed. And it shows you what, Catholic, what, what, what is really going on here with Catholicism. Why they're, I mean, how, would the real, would the true church with the true representations of Christ use all this fraud to try to uh, uh, further their causes with lies. But let's go ahead and go through, we'll, look, we'll read through the slide and then you'll get uh, an idea of this. So, uh, but this, this is uh, completely factual. You can, you can go, you can uh, do your own research on this. Um, but for like two centuries or something, uh, it was, um, it was, or several centuries, it was, um, considered, uh, these documents were considered to be authentic. Anyway, Pope Nicholas, I'm not saying he was Saint Nicholas, but he was Pope Nicholas I, 858 86 through 867, was the first pope to wear a crown. So Pope Nicholas I was the first pope to quote the forged false historical documents and to use them as the basis for advancing his claims of authority. The Isidorian Decretals purported to be letters and decrees of bishops and councils of the 2nd and 3rd centuries in favorable uh, to the papal authority. The Isidorian Decretals were designed to exalt the power of the pope and papal authority and demonstration of continual papal authority in Christian antiquity. Such documents and 
antedate the Pope's temporal power by five centuries. Uh, it had such success that it became the standard work of the law of the Roman Church and thus the basis of all canon law and scholastic theology. However, these documents were completely fraud. Remember we talked a little bit about the church fathers. I said, don't be misled when they talk about the early church fathers. You have to remember that a lot of the voices of Christianity was suppressed because Catholicism was so strong. And, uh, and then, then to add to this fraud, what's interesting about these uh, passing off of these uh, documents, they, they claim that they were uh, uh, from the second and third century, from these early, you know, from the early church councils. But the councils, remember the council meetings really began, uh, the major council meetings began with Constantine. Remember, he set, him, he set himself uh, ahead of the church, and he started getting all the, the church together. Well, this claims to be older than that. Actually, Constantine uh, began that with uh, Eusebius, who he commanded. Remember, we brought up that he said, make 50 bi Bibles and circulate them in the church because he wanted everybody to have the same Bible. His Bible, right? So, uh, and that's where all this uh, problem came from the translation. But anyway, they tried to pull this off, and yet where they made their big flaw is these documents, which were supposed to be authentic, were all written in Latin. <clears throat> and they said that it was the joint consensus of all the church. Well, the rest of the church didn't, didn't write Latin. That was the beginning of some of them looking into it and saying, saying wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Uh, the next thing is called the Great Cleavage. Uh, St. Photius was a firm opponent of papal intrigues and designs upon the Orthodox Church of the East. What they're talking about, the cleavage, is between the Orthodox Church and the uh, Roman Church. This became the great, not only the great, you can also call it the great divide or the great split and the great, great chasm between the two. Uh, remember, there was, uh, just like we saw the nation divided into the east and the west, and the Rome, the uh, statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the east and the west, the church split into the east and the west as well. When, when Roman Catholicism say that they were the only true church, they were the original church, they were the power in their, basically the original church in the west, because they, they persecuted and they, they gained control. But the eastern part of the empire was never Roman Catholic. And so I, I know when I was raised, uh, I was raised Catholic, and my parents, my mother especially, told me that um, one time I asked, I said, uh, because my, my father's uh, sister, who would have been my aunt, uh, was Lutheran. Now, I had never heard of anything else but Catholic. And so one day I asked my mother, I said, what is, what is a Lutheran? And she responded so negatively. She said, she goes, oh, that's one of those Protestant things. And I said, what? I never even heard the word Protestant, you know. I said, what's that? And she says, she said, well, there was one original church, and uh, it was Catholic, and then they decided to, uh, these people decided to leave the church and form their own churches and cause all these problems. And that's where Lutheranism came from. <laughs> so, it's just, and then they're all, they're all church of the devil. You know, it's kind of remind, anybody ever seen the movie Water Boy with Adam Sandler? And everything that goes wrong, his mother said, the devil, the devil, the devil did that, the devil did that, and... The devil's got you, boy. So that's kind of the way my mother reacted to, uh, and all I did was ask a question. Well, what is, you know, and uh, uh, anyway, she didn't want, she didn't want me to know anything about that. That's like when I, when I first started uh, reading the Bible, uh, I actually was uh, out of, I was out of the military in uh, 1979. I was living in, uh, uh, in there in my mother's house, my mother and father. And I started reading the Bible, and she, uh, she told me that I should not be reading the Bible, that she's seen this happen before. Someone will read the Bible, and they'll get all confused and leave the church. 
<laughs> so, and that's exactly what happened. You know, I read the Bible. I guess I got all confused. I saw the truth, and I left the, left the Catholic Church. But it's all, you know, now again, they don't know any better. Mo if you talk to Catholics who have been sheltered in Catholicism and all what they, all what they know, mo they will tell you ca the Catholic Church was the original church. It was set up by the Apostle Peter, and then came all the division, and it was against the Pope and against the truth, and it's all of the devil, and, you know, you just don't go there. And that's what they believe. And you can't, like, you can't pull them out of it. The original church was not Protestant. It can't, original church can't be Protestant because Protestant means we protest against the Pope. Right. It, they made it protest. So, so pro, pro, by definition, Protestantism has to come after Catholicism because the whole movement of protesting against Catholicism had, you know, presupposes that there's Catholic. But the original church was not Catholic. It was not Protestant. It was Christianity. And there were, if you look in history, there were many different flavors of Christianity going on before the rising up of, of uh, a religious hierarchy and the suppressing. And su suppression is never better than freedom. In my, in my opinion, suppression is never better than freedom. I want to be free. Let me choose what I'm going to believe. Let me, don't take my Bible away and make it forbidden for me to know the truth and to research myself. Let me see the documents, explore what is fraud, what is not, and make my own decisions. That's my prayer. That's what I want. Anyway, so uh, Pope Nicholas, th this is interesting because uh, when, when the East and the Western Church split, you have both, they had hierarchy of re these religious priests on either side. So the Pope Nicholas, he excommunicated, excommunicated Photius, the patriarch of Constantinople. Remember Constantinople was the east side Constantine set up. And uh, now this, then this uh, high priest over there of, the, of the, um, uh, the patriarch over on the eastern church, he excommunicated the western church pope. So they were both coming back and... I'm excommunicating you. And it's in a, the, so then the other one goes, well, then I'm going to excommunicate you. And it's like, come on. They were like little children going back and forth, you know, and they're supposed to be religious leaders. There was, how many churches did Jesus say there were? There was one church, one body, right? We weren't supposed to be split up. We weren't supposed to be excommunicating each other because you won't listen to me and I won't listen to you. Anyway, the claims of the Roman Catholic Church became unbearable. The East finally separated itself. The breach has become wider down through the centuries. The brutal, and, and uh, one, one of the things that made it so bad was a brutal treatment of Constantinople by the armies of the Pope Innocent II during the Crusades and the creation of the dogma of papal infallibility in 1870 deepened the chasm even more. In other words, in 1870, they came up with this doctrine that when the Pope makes a decision, and he sits on his throne, in which we've talked about that new throne, which is kind of scary if you see what it looks like, because it's really weird, but um, it looks very satanic to me. But uh, anyway, uh, this idea of uh, the Pope sitting on his throne and infallib being uh, infallible, making infallible decisions concerning the church, that means he cannot possibly make a mistake. Infallibility means he cannot make a mistake. Now, we do have an infallible word, and that is the word of God. We have the infallible word of God. We don't need an infallible pope. This is why I love the word of God, because it doesn't change. This is why I love having a copy of the King James, because... I can go day by day by day by day, and the Bible doesn't change. I told you the story of having three different NIVs, and they were all different. This scares me, and I think it's rightly so, rightly justified. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. But anyway, they didn't come up with that pope, papal uh, uh, infallibility until 1870. Anyway, the next slide shows us... Um, 
the Crusades. Now, what was the Crusades, the whole point of the Crusades? Ro the Pope called for an army against the Muslims. And the majority of it was about getting Jerusalem. The Muslims had Jerusalem. Jerusalem became known as the third most sacred site of Islam. By the way, the way Islam, uh, in Islam, once it comes under a territory, it comes under uh, Muslim control, it can never be let go of Muslim control. They are sworn, no matter what happens, to get it back. This is why there's so much problems over, you know, in, in Jerusalem, all these wars all the time. There's never going to be peace because between Islam and, and Israel and the Jews. There's never going to be peace because Islam had uh, Jerusalem. They had it for many years. They put that mosque, or they, they put that mosque right on the Holy Temple site, and they're not going to give it up. Uh, uh, Mo uh, not Muhammad, but uh, down through history, they claimed that that was the the third. May, maybe it was Muhammad. They claimed it was the third holiest site of Islam. They're saying that Jerusalem is now going to become the most holiest site of Islam. So anyway, there's a lot going on. But the the Crusades, uh, many Jews and Muslims were slaughtered. Uh, beginning with the Jews in Europe. Uh, what people don't, uh, and, and people might, I don't even know, do they? I don't even know if they study this in, in school anymore. I know when I went to school, we had history class. And when you, when you had hi world history, you studied a lot about the church. But you know, I never paid any attention to it, so I really didn't learn it until later on in my life. And I was floored because after I was a Christian, I met, had met uh, someone, uh, I worked at Catholic Social Services, and uh, I met a girl who had majored in history. We were talking one day, and she's talking about um, uh, the church in history, Christianity in history, and world history. She said, didn't you ever have world history? And I said, I said well, yeah, I had world history. And she said, the, the, the church made up a major part because all of Europe had to do with church, right? It was either the Eastern Church or the Western Church or the massacres, and and uh, and I didn't know any of that. But what many, many people don't realize is the Crusades was the Pope's army. They were made up of, of uh, mercenaries, and anyone who could come. What what the Pope did was promise them. Uh, a uh, a pass into heaven if they would serve in his military. In other words, it didn't matter what their sins were because they were serving in the crusades in the military, so they got a free ride into heaven. When these, when these crusaders went through Europe, they not only killed Jews, they not only killed Muslims, they killed Christians. They would stop as they were headed towards Jerusalem and they would rob and pillage every private person's property and food and rape the women and just go on. And if the husband tried to protect his wife, he would get killed. They would kill the children and then they would just go on. They would, they would rob and steal and because they, they had no fear. They had a free ride, a free ticket into heaven. This is not of God. In fact, nowhere in the scripture does the Bible tell us to pick up the sword and fight. It said, go into all the world. And we are told to pick up the sword, but it's the sword of our mouth. The word of God. That's, that, that's, that's what we stand for. So, you know, this crusades thing, this was never, this was never um, about, uh, about Christianity. This was about... Rome. Revelation 18.2 says, He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, said that in the book of Revelation, what is Babylon? We have gone several or many weeks in, in the issue of what is represented of Babylon has come up many times. It's, it's come up. 
and, and looking at um, from a uh, perspective of that Babylon is this woman who sits on this beast. Remember, we said that this woman, this is that false religious system, rides on the beast. If she's riding on the beast, she's the one in control. Right? She's steering the beast. Revelation 18, 3 and 4 says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Remember um, when we when we started reading, and what she was guilty of leading the people to f- commit fornication and in sacrifice to idols and to eat things that were offered to idols. Remember? Well, look what this scripture says. This is Jezebel uh, of Thyatira, um, the same spirit behind it. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So the scripture clearly says if you are involved in this system in any way, this Babylonian system, which is represented by this woman, this harlot who's controlling the beast with seven heads, you need to come out. This is not a, uh, this is not a recommendation. And because look what's going to happen. There's a curse that's coming down upon Babylon. It says, he cried, the angel cried with a mighty voice, strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen and fallen, become a habitation of devils or demons and a hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Remember, remember when we talked about the, the, um, we talked about the uh, mustard seed, and we 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 um, the sower sows a seed, and we said that the the birds came, the birds came to devour the seed, and they were hiding in the branches. Remember that. And Jesus said the meaning of the bird, the fowl, was that it was Satan sitting in the branches. His purpose to devour the seed. Now we see the curse that comes upon this Babylonian religious system. He said, Babylon has become a habitation of devils, which literally is the same as demons, which are spirits, right? And the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Remember the uh, the storks? Stork was it that uh, carried the woman of wickedness? Uh, we had that uh, a couple weeks ago or something. And uh, and those were, un- I mentioned, those were unclean birds according to the law. He says there at the second part, he said, um, I heard a voice say, come out of her, my people. See, my people. He still claims my people are in this system. He hasn't given up on the people. It's the system that's corrupt. He's still reaching out every day. He will continue to reach out and reach out and reach out. All until the rapture comes. He's continuing with the gospel. Come out of her, my people. And even after the rapture, the message will still be the same. Come out of her, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Of course, at that time, they will have to stand up in opposition against a system which the works of the beast have been reported, they've been identified down through history. All you have to do is take one instance. We don't have to take all the instances, just one. One word, the Inquisition. Some things I've read estimate 68 million victims of the Inquisition, and the torture, and the instruments of torture were horrendous. And anyone who's going to identify with the system will be identified and become partakers of her sins and receive of her plagues. If, you, if, we, if we know any... We, 
I, frankly, I don't know other than saying it, but I do know this. I was growing up in that system. And you'll find out you run into a lot of people. Wasn't Donna involved in that? You run into a lot of people that were once involved in that system and they came out. This scripture right here, the one we just read about come out, is the one that got me out. Because I knew when I read that, I, I, I heard the Spirit talking to me. Once this thing is, this Spirit, and I believe it's the Spirit of Lilith behind this, but once the Spirit is identified, and you don't have to call it Lilith, once it's identified for what it is, a female sister, or not female sister, but, but the female represents a, a religion, a religious system. It stands in opposition to the bride of Christ. There's the truth and the false. One is a pure, spotless bride. The other one is a whore who prostitutes and commits spiritual fornication and idolatry. And so that's how the Bible contrasts it. But behind that is a spirit essence. And she deludes the... And the people... There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of people that are not so good in the system, but there's a lot of good people in the system. And there, and I, I, I spoke about the, the, the girl last week who, I mean, you talk to her and you know she loves God. And she is so much seeking after apparitions. We talked about St. Saint, Saint Catherine who started seeking, she wanted to have a, 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 uh, an appearance. She wanted a manifestation of the mother of God. And so Satan obliged. 